Welcome to Making Therapy Better, the podcast that brings together some of the top minds in psychotherapy as well as everyday clinicians to talk about where the field is headed and how we can achieve better mental health care for everyone. Making Therapy Better is hosted by Professor Bruce Wampold, who has dedicated his career to understanding how therapy works and advocating evidence-based methods for improving outcomes. His guest today is Scott Miller, Ph.D., Scott is the founder of the International Center for Clinical Excellence, a consortium of clinicians, researchers, and educators dedicated to promoting excellence in behavioral health. He conducts workshops and trainings in the United States and abroad, helping hundreds of agencies and organizations, both private and public, to achieve superior results. He has written numerous books and articles, including Better Results, Using Deliberate Practice to Improve Therapeutic Effectiveness. Making Therapy Better is brought to you by CarePaths. CarePaths has been helping in-person and virtual therapy practices thrive for over 20 years with their complete web-based EHR and practice management platform. As mental health care evolves, CarePaths is leading the way in making measurement-based care easy and cost-effective for therapists. Visit carepaths.com to sign up for a free trial today. And now, without further ado, Episode 2 of Making Therapy Better, Measurement-Based Care and Deliberate Practice with Scott Miller, Ph.D. So, Scott, um, this is a real opportunity and honor to talk to you for an hour. Um, As we were just discussing before uh, we went on the air, um, we've known each other. We calculated over 40 years. Amazing. And over those years, we've worked together, talked about psychotherapy and mental health services. So I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. So, Scott, one of the primary areas that you're known for is the use of um, the patient's progress in therapy and the patient's perception of the relationship in um, defining and planning the way therapy um, takes place and for improving the quality of the services. Mm. So, you know, I don't Often I know the answer to questions when I ask them, but I don't know this. How did you get interest in using patient progress and indicators of relationships to improve psychotherapy? Well, I would say that that it's largely because of relationships that I ended up in this area. I have always been a very anxious clinician from the time I was a graduate student, I was really pretty young for a graduate student. A lot of the people that were in our program had had years of experience practicing. You'll recall there was a nurse in the program. There were people with master's degree and I was coming straight up out of a bachelor's program. And so I really didn't know what to do. And I wanted somebody to tell me what to do with people in the room. And I really struggled. I ended up at a clinic in Milwaukee that was developing a particular approach to therapy. They were very willing to tell me how to work. And that was a great experience. I gained lots of confidence. The only thing I didn't gain is an improvement in my results. It was (laughs) It was an illusion in many respects. I I was very confident now when I went into the room with clients, but our own data, we had independent researchers come in and survey samples of our clients, and we were about as effective as everyone else. And that was really very challenging. How could that be? I wondered. And I had two people, two very important relationships. One was with Lynn Johnson, who, interestingly enough, was a local psychologist, local to where I was going to graduate school, who let me sit behind his one-way mirror and watch him work. This wasn't somebody sitting behind a mirror watching me work, but I got to watch him work. That also helped me build confidence. But Lynn had developed a simple alliance measure called the session rating scale, and he had it completed at every session and talked with the clients about it. 
The other person who was a big influence was somebody who wrote letters for me to get into graduate school, and that was Michael Lambert. And Michael had developed this lengthy tool called the Outcome Questionnaire 45. And so after our own results showed that we were no more effective than anyone else, I thought, maybe if I use these tools, at least I'll find out if I'm helping that person. And then if not, maybe I could do something about it. And that's really where it all started. And all based on my overwhelming anxiety about wanting to be helpful to people. So that's well, where it came from. Yeah, that's really interesting, Scott. So it was your own um, uh, concern or worry about how effective you were and yeah. the fact that you really don't know. I mean, that's the part that that through the years uh, has really become apparent that um, therapists don't really have a good idea of how effective they are. Now, this isn't a criticism of therapists. This is just the nature of the way we do our work. Yeah. And I had a couple of therapy experiences by that particular time, and both of them were fine. But it was also very clear to me that the therapist didn't know a lot of the feelings I was having about the work we were doing. And so the first two therapists that I saw in my own clinical lifetime, I left without saying anything. And not to be specifically critical about them, I, I had a lot of my own clients who would disappear. And I didn't know what had happened to them. And frequently, if I tried to follow up, I didn't get very clear information. Plus, it was after the fact the the horse had already left that barn. So really, what, what could I do? And what could I learn from that? And, and like you say, it was primarily because and I'll, I'll, I'll call it what it, I experience it as and I have the same feeling today. It's an anxiousness. It's a desire to please and to be helpful uh, to people. And that really pushed me to begin asking on a more routine basis. Well, Scott, um, we all got into the field because we want to help people. Hmm. And what you're basically saying is without that information, um, it's really very difficult to uh, know how therapy is going and to adjust therapy as needed to help Yes, yeah. absolutely. I would say nearly impossible. And, and more importantly, Bruce, to for me, at least to avoid blind spots and hopeful thinking, mm. because I had clients that I thought, well, this is really going well. And then they didn't show up or what a great session. And next session wasn't mm. uh, and and vice versa. So I'm not suggesting and I know you wouldn't either that routine outcome monitoring is some kind of panacea that solves all problems, but it's certainly an improvement over what we've done before. No physician would operate without a blood pressure cuff or a stethoscope, fairly simple tools, but so helpful in augmenting our ability to see a bit more and to potentially be more helpful. Yeah. The metaphor I use sometimes now is golfing. You go to the golfing range to practice your drive and you watch, you know, your, your uh, uh, shanking every time you hit the ball. So that's some information to get better. But if you're hitting those balls at night, you can't see where they're going. Yeah. You really know what's, what's going on. Yeah. Scott, you brought up a good point about uh, um, it's not a panacea or it's not going to uh, magically make uh, therapy better. So we know the research pretty well. Um, there are mixed effects. Um, the randomized clinical trials, usually there's a moderate incremental improvement. Um, but in some cases, it really doesn't help very much. Mm -hmm. So like any information, it's how you use it. So Talk a bit about what you feel is the way that this information can be used most profitably to help improve therapy. 
Well, I think one thing is really important to know about routinely monitoring your outcomes. And when I use the word outcomes, and I know you would refer similarly, I mean both outcomes and relationship. Mm -hmm. So these are, and the reason we're assessing these is because there's something we can do something about. We can notice the outcomes and change what we're doing in the room. The relationship feedback can give us some hints about, well, is this about how I'm acting? I miss perceptions, the goals that maybe I think we should be working on in care. And as simple as it sounds on the surface, we'll just monitor care and talk with the client about it. The evidence we do have, in particular, a study, I'm really proud that the work and feedback informed care has. It's an implementation study by Heidi Bratland, a researcher out of Norway, which shows that it takes time to learn to use this kind of feedback in care. Mm -hmm. So some of the inconsistent results, in my opinion, are a function of acting as though if you just start using measures, then your outcomes will improve. When in fact, it takes a whole shift in attitude. The whole point of this is to facilitate better engagement with the clients to really show that I've understood them and that I'm willing to take some steps to change the direction we're going. Again, as simple as that sound in practice, it can be really hard, especially if you have six people or seven people a day and you're having to adjust to a third or half of them. So the first thing is, I think to use the data successfully, you have to be patient. My sense about this is running around and consulting that you should give yourself a year before you really see any improvement in your outcomes. Mm -hmm. The second way I think to think about using your data is to improve responsiveness in the moment. So what I mean by that is I find out that the client feels like I don't understand what they want to work on. I think they need to work on their drinking. What they want to do is save their relationship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as much as I think my education says they should do this, I'm going to have to bend if I hope to keep them engaged in treatment. But critically, that gives me a, uh, the opportunity to respond to them right at that particular time. Being inflexible is something that I know from my personal therapeutic experiences, whether the therapists perceive themselves that way or not, my experience of them is inflexible in terms of accommodating me were a big cause of why I decided, yeah, I'm, I'm not going back. Mm -hmm. So, and, yeah, flexibility is, is a key part, not just between sessions where you plan to do something different, but in the moment as well. Yeah, within those sessions, uh, key accommodations. And I, I'm not saying therapists don't do a, 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 a try to do that. The measures just give me one more possible time to do that before we end, before we part at this particular time. It's good to know, did the client feel like something was missing mm. in terms of their care? Mm. And then the third. So if we have taking time with implementation, mm. building responsiveness and flexibility, the third one for me is looking for what I like to call non-random errors. Mm -hmm. Meaning that as I gather this data, I start to get a picture of who I am as a practitioner mm -hmm. and the patterns in my work. Some of those patterns are going to be helpful, some of them less helpful. And maybe I can identify those things that I do on an ongoing basis that may serve as a governor holding my outcomes from uh, improving. Mm -hmm. And so those are three ways. Let's focus on the, the third way for a minute, mm -hmm. because I think this is uh, interesting and absolutely critical. And that is um, uh, how we use the data, not just to help this particular client, but how to improve ourselves. Now, mm -hmm. I challenge you a, a bit because the evidence seems to indicate that uh, this kind of routine outcome monitoring um, does improve with particular patients 
as we know, particularly those that are doing less than expected, less well than expected. But it also looks like that the therapists using this feedback don't improve over time. So that experience, that information, helpful for a particular client, but not for um, the general skill level of the therapist. Absolutely. How do you explain that? Well, and see, what I love about this particular question is that is the question we had about 10 years ago. Mike Lambert did an interesting study where he found that therapists, when they were using the feedback system, had better outcomes. But when they weren't, it was the they got feedback on half of their clients. They didn't seem to learn anything from the feedback. In other words, it, it, you would think that if you were getting feedback with 50% of your clients, you would start to notice certain things. Yeah. They didn't. And to me, that was a huge puzzle and a very unsatisfying, anxious Scott, very yeah. unsatisfying experience. Well, I'm not learning anything here. How, how could that possibly be? That's why I divided this into errors of responsiveness and non-random errors. And the question really was, is what what does it take to move beyond? Now, we don't expect, say, physicians to be able to read blood pressure without a cuff. Although I think in some ways they might be able to train to do that. But this is such a simple way to assess blood pressure. It shortens the length of time to get to the intervention that's needed. But we began turning our attention in light of such findings that you're mentioning to this whole new topic of deliberate practice. Mm -hmm. And what it meant to me was that you would have to spend extra time devoted to understanding the data that you were getting from your clients on an aggregate level. And frankly, that's never been talked about in our field. Instead, we've been wedded to treatment models and doing the treatment model right. And I will go even one step further and say, if you did the model right, steps A, B, C, D, and in the right order, then you were absolved of responsibility in the event that your client didn't get better. And that has been a dangerous conclusion, in my opinion. It didn't lead to the next step, which was, well, why didn't the model help this client? And why don't I help these clients in this particular way? Deliberate practice is really about looking for those non-random errors. And as I say, that requires extra time. And we are it's the wild west right now, in my opinion, with regard to research on deliberate practice. We're just beginning to peel that onion. Let the, I, I want to focus uh, some on this uh, idea of deliberate practice. But before we get there, let's yeah. kind of tease out um, the routine outcome monitoring. Sure. First, we should say there's so many different names for routine outcome monitoring. That's one yeah. of them. Uh, the popular one is because we want to uh, emulate medicine as measurement-based care. Yeah. Um, uh, other people have used fit. Um, what are some other names, Scott? We, there's a whole patient-centered practice, yeah. or yeah, yeah, yeah. proms. Um, so this idea of treatment models, uh, uh, and I'll kind of uh, insert some of my opinion here as well. We've sure. had these discussions over the years. Um, it's the inflexible use of treatment packages that seems to be problematic. And yeah. that's consistent with what you're saying. Yeah. If, you, if you have such faith that following the steps in this treatment are the best way for the client to improve, then you're not really listening to what the client needs and you're not flexible in the way you described. So there's this, this um, uh, kind of... Uh, uh, iatrogenic way of delivering treatments. Mm. So I would add, though, that a coherent treatment is an important important part of of therapy. What we're doing in therapy has to make sense 
to the patient. So it's it's that confusion about, I meet with you every week. I don't know what we're working on. Uh, you seem to care for me. You're empathic and understanding. And I really uh, appreciate that and benefit from it. But I, I want to do some hard work towards these goals. Sure. Yeah. And so, you're not going to get any disagreement from me about that. You know that I believe I we have to have a, a we have to have a coherent ap- approach. For for me, I see these approaches as therapeutically inert. They're given life because they make sense to the participants and provide direction and structure. Mm-hmm. Now, for most therapists, when you get trained in these models, that conclusion is a very unsatisfying one. I thought that when I confronted your dysfunctional thought that that was responsible for alleviating your depression. And my response is, no, probably not. But the client found it intriguing and they participated and they got activated. And as a result, their depression begins to lift or it's incompatible with their new behavior. They're doing something. Yeah. That's uh, reasonably promoting some kind of healthy behavior yeah. that the patient feels like um, will help them uh, uh, improve. Yes. So in a way, it's it's part of it is is similar to what Jerome Frank called about uh, remoralization. Yeah. Or other people would call hopefulness or positive expectations. A lot of different ways to to talk about this. Mm. But it's also something that's more healthy. Thinking about the world in a positive rather than a negative frame uh, is adaptive. Other therapies work on interpersonal relationships, whatever. They're all promoting something. Mm. I know in your taxonomy, which we will get to, this idea of, of... coherent uh, uh, in therapy is an important part of it. Absolutely. And, and I, and I will say, and maybe we'll get to this a bit later that in consulting with therapists who are really trying to take apart their data and find their non-random errors, the number of people for whom structuring is an issue is smaller. This isn't scientific, just my experience than the number who have problems in conveying empathy to people Mm -hmm. or even knowing what the client is there for. It's a big surprise to most. Mm -hmm. They're looking for some particular strategy or technique that will make this episode of care therapeutic. We look at the data and the client doesn't feel understood or doesn't Mm -hmm. feel like they're working on Mm -hmm. what they came to work on. Right, right. So uh, uh, too much emphasis on a strategy for overcoming without remembering that, you know, this isn't just true in psychotherapy, it's true in medicine as well. Yeah. You want the clinician to understand you, to work in your best interest and care for you. Yeah. That's not a small thing. No. Especially no. in today's world. Mm. So the other part we should mention is we know um, there's more variability uh, among the therapists in terms of outcomes within treatment. So there are, and I think this is very consistent with you what you just said, there are therapists um, delivering cognitive behavioral therapy that are um, astoundingly yeah. effective. Yeah. And there are other ones we have some concern about. And you and I, you and I have looked a lot of, at a lot of data over the years, and we we know this is true. Yeah. The, the idea about learning from your practice um, is really interesting, isn't it? It uh, is it, that that just going through performance, uh, like playing music or or doing therapy doesn't lead to better outcomes with some kind, without some kind of um, deliberate practice towards some goals. Yes. Say more now about deliberate practice and and how that works in therapy. Oh, I I think it's telling that when you ask therapists, this is Renestat Norlinsky's work, they say that they learn the most from their clients. And you look at the research 
-hmm. and you think, I don't see it. You know, I, I don't see that we're learning. I don't see we're learning much of anything if we're if we're assessing that by an improvement in the reach and effect of our work, who we reach and how big of an effect we actually have. So we had struggled with the problem that we mentioned earlier that therapists could even measure their outcomes and still not get better if they didn't have the outcomes right in front of their face and have the time to really process them with clients. And I had no idea how to account for this. I still am rid riddled with anxiety about whether or not we're on the right track. We had these top performing therapists, the kind that you mentioned that could be CBT therapists or they could be psychodynamic therapists or solution focused therapists. And some were just really good at their work. How did we know? Well, now we had outcome data. Mm -hmm. And initially, when we started interviewing these folks, I, I looked at the things that I'd been trained to look at, like, well, is it a particular model? Is it their age? Is it the amount of time they've been in the field? Is it a gender? Is it a cultural background? None mm -hmm. of that stuff seemed to make a difference. And I was communicating with a former colleague, Lynn Johnson, and saying, you know, I give up. I think this is random variation. And, you know, a stock goes up one year and is down another. A great company uh, is great for five years and then it dies. So, you know, it's just a random thing. And then I stumbled on, quite by accident, an article in Fortune magazine that was written by Jeff Colvin about Anders Ericsson. And Anders Ericsson was a Swedish psychologist who had been studying top performance in a number of areas. Chess, for example, was a big one. And he had coined this term deliberate practice, which essentially was reaching for performance objectives just beyond your current ability and studying the process by which people did that. Most of us, he pointed out, which was really critical, did not do that. Once we achieved a certain level of automaticity, what I mean by that is we become confident because we no longer have to torture ourselves with every decision about our performance. Once we get there, most of us plateau and then maybe subtly decline uh, uh, over time in our performance. But there was a select group. They didn't. They looked specifically at their errors. They looked at and had coaches which could help them focus on recurring patterns that seem to inhibit further growth in their performance. And they simply devoted more time to their effort in reaching for those objectives. Now I say simply devoted more time, not just a function of time, but the types of activities that they engaged in. They weren't just replicating what they already did, mm. but rather identifying those errors, having a coach help develop exercises specific to working those weaker performance muscles and pushing on. Mm. Well, it's really interesting when you think of expert performers in every field, um, they need um, that input from a coach or an instructor or somebody. I use the example of Rafael Nadal, who um, on his day off at Wimbledon, is out there practicing with his coach. Now, his coach doesn't play, obviously, near as well as, as Nadal does, but he's able to spot what needs to be improved. Yeah. Get just incrementally better. Yeah. And, you know, that I think is the perhaps one of the unfortunate big lies in our field that you have to have somebody who does this for a living that is does therapy for a living who's seen their own clients that can coach you to expertise. Actually, what they need is to be able to do what you just said, which is see the areas that fall short and point them out to you. You know the literature better than I do about supervision. It's 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 not exactly reassuring that hours and hours of supervision doesn't lead to better outcomes necessarily. So I don't think our history of supervision is where it's at. I do think we need these performance coaches. That performance coach has to have a way to identify what specifically you need to change in your performance to achieve better outcomes. We've mentioned two of them so far, things that, and this is where I think 
we come full circle as a field back to work that you have been at the forefront of, looking for factors associated with effective care that are non-ideological, that aren't model-based. So we've mentioned two. One is relationship factors. You may be lacking in a specific way or connecting to specific types or groups of people. Another one is structural deficits, how you begin the session, how the middle part, how you structure it. The end of the session, you and I were having a conversation not a few days ago saying that um, frequently therapists didn't give people things to do. It was all in-session behavior mm -hmm. rather than saying, here's a useful thing you should do between our visits. Mm -hmm. Any and all of those might contribute. And a coach, their expertise, I think, is highlighting what you may need to do, which I think also defies this idea that there can be a book that contains a preset group of exercises that if you just practice them, you'll be a top performer. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. There are any thousand, thousands of videos online on YouTube for almost every activity. We should have the best performers ever in a variety of areas, but we don't. Some people excel, the rest are sort of average. Well, you're really suggesting a different model of supervision, and we should talk about that in a few minutes. I, I wanted to comment on a on a couple of things. Okay. In, it, it's, a, you know, I want to mention, Scott, you work with therapists all over the world. You see the data, you've developed measures, the session rating scale and the outcome rating scale mm. for assessing um, the, the functioning and the relationship mm. uh, of, of clients. So when you talk about uh, um, working with therapists to get better, this isn't just an academic exercise for you. You do this with groups of therapists uh, all over the world. I do. And you've seen their outcomes. Yeah. So it's not just um, your impression about what's helpful, but you, you've looked at this data. Yeah. The other thing I want to emphasize, and I mentioned this before, but it's it's really important that, you know, therapists um, uh, entered the field, I think, um, almost all, hopefully, um, because they want to really help people. Yeah. And the lack of expertise or improvement um, isn't really due to kind of their motivation as much as it is a structural problem. The, the way mental health services are set up, as you said, you're seeing six or eight clients during the day. You don't have time uh, for the kinds of activities that are probably necessary to improve, nor the information, the availability of a coach and so forth. So just to be clear, um, and, and we've had these conversations with Scott, that it, it, it's not uh, the fault. Uh, we got a bunch of lousy therapists. No, absolutely not. Yeah, it's, and this is what I want to talk about later in the interview is about uh, what can we do uh, in terms of changing the mental health system so people, therapists can actually get better. Yeah. Let's well, talk I, I was just going to add one one little piece of, one editorial, I suppose, because I was filling out an application for, I won't say which professional organization, but it was one of them, so that an activity that I was going to do could be granted continuing education units. And what they said was, you have to show that this treatment is evidence-based and this thing you're going to train them in is evidence-based. And to me, it was really ironic that I have to show that what I'm going to teach is evidence-based when the entire continuing education enterprise is not evidence-based yeah. at all. It's this giant pyramid scheme that somebody benefits from, but not our clients. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that we need to get rid of and trash everything, but it, it certainly means that there could be a more useful and productive way to help therapists do what I experience in them wanting to do, if only evidenced by the fact that they spend millions of dollars 
and hundreds of hours of time every year going to continuing education events, mm -hmm. which does not continually educate them. No. Yeah, it's ironic to, that they want evidence. What you talk about has to be evidence-based. Yeah. Continuing education itself is not evidence-based. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, let's talk about supervision for a minute. Mm, um, sure. Because we've supervised uh, many therapists over the years. Yeah. And I've sat in on supervision sessions or listened to supervision sessions, case conferences. Um, so I remember being at a case conference at a well-known psychiatric uh, center, and they spent uh, um, the entire time talking about the patient, their diagnosis, their personality disorder. Um, and then they opened it up to the floor. Are there any questions? And I was a guest, but I said, um, well, what as a therapist do you need to do differently to help this patient? And it was like I committed heresy because we <laughs> learned by talking about the client, right? Yeah. So um, how would you structure supervision to be more productive. And when I say productive, you and I are always talking about how can we improve outcomes? Yeah. So the first is, I think it's, this is very radical. It's time to retire that word. I don't know why our field needs supervision when medicine and mechanics and the rest don't need that. So I think it's time to get rid of that. The term that we've been using is outcome consultation. Mm -hmm. And what drives therapists to that process is their work with the individual client. And in particular, clients that they are not helping, either as evidenced by a lack of progress or by poor alliances. And an alliance can be poor in one of two ways. You can get low alliance scores, which indicate that there are problems within, or you can get perfect alliance scores. Everything's great. Yeah. So there's nothing to talk about. Yeah. And that's what drives people to the supervision hour, as opposed to the therapist's interpersonal experience of the particular client. Therapist's yeah. assessment of whether or not their client's making progress weak correlation with the client's experience of progress. So I got to get the client's voice into that. Mm -hmm. Then what we do in what we call fit or feedback informed consultation is we start there. This client is not making progress or has issues in the alliance. And we talk in a pretty simple way. There are four elements in the alliance. Number one is, what is it that the client says they want? Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, I'm really surprised by the number of struggles there are around answering that question. Mm -hmm. Struggles in what way? Well, a couple of things. I will hear, for example, well, the client is bipolar. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's interesting, but that's not what I asked. Yeah. I asked, what does a client say they want from coming to care? Because if they're bipolar, maybe, again, they want to have a better relationship with their, with their adult child. Mm -hmm. or stop their drinking, mm -hmm. et cetera. The, the other thing I, I often find is that the goals have now been translated into this very rigid SMART format that the client can no longer rate, relate to, small, specific, concrete, measurable, and the client loses all connection to the meaning mm -hmm. of being in a relationship with you at the time. Mm -hmm. So what does the client want? In what way do they want you to help them with that problem? Mm -hmm. Do the means and methods make sense to them mm -hmm. and fit their background, culture, language, and worldview? So those are the four elements that we talk about with the therapist. And at any point in that discussion, the therapist may say, I don't, for example, I, I'm not exactly clear what the client wants. Mm -hmm. the the objective then is clear you got to go back in the room and find out 
Or the client says they don't want to take medication, even though I think because that would make them feel dependent, part of their preference, who they are as a person. I've got to figure out either what would be persuasive or develop some other way of approaching this particular concern. Because if they disengage, well, I'm clearly not going to help. By going through this process, what does a client want? In what way? Consistent with what values and preferences? And what am I being hired to do? Who am I supposed to be? Very often, ideas begin to emerge for how the therapist can go back to the room and relate differently to the client. Mm -hmm. Scott, those are set four such important things. I want you to say them again because uh, this is you've broken it down in such a important and understandable way. Hmm. I want to remember them better, so I, I'm assuming the audience does as well. But go through them again. What does the client want? Mm -hmm. And what we mean by this is when was the last time you asked, mm -hmm. or what was the client's stated reason? In coming, if you're a substance abuse counselor and the client is there because they got a DUI, but what they're really concerned about is that their partners now had enough and they're leaving. Mm -hmm. The client says, I want to talk about fixing my relationship, but you insist mm -hmm. that they work on their substance use. Mm -hmm. You risk losing the client. Now, remember, all of this is predicated on the idea that the outcome data has shown us that things are at risk. Mm -hmm. If you can convince the client to work on their substance abuse, even though their goal is to save their relationship, more power to you if the outcomes go up and the relationship is strong. Mm -hmm. But if the relationship isn't strong and the outcomes are headed in the other direction, you better change your mind. Yeah. Well, or agreement, on, agreement on goals is, has always been uh, a focus of the, the work on alliance and understanding the alliance. Perfect. Okay. So what does the client want? In what way? So what, what are you supposed to actually do in the room? What, what are your actions supposed to, to be? Are they looking for advice? And by the way, I was told, or I seem to intuit on the part of the graduate training I got, you never do that. Never give advice. I have to tell you, lots of clients think you're giving advice, even if you don't think you are. And many clients, a very small hint and piece of advice may be the thing that keeps them in, in, in the therapy with you. In what way do they want your help? Mm -hmm. Consistent with what values and preferences and identity? Who do they see themselves as? And are the means and methods that you're suggesting congruent with that mm -hmm. or orthogonal to what they are, who they are saying they are? And what are you being hired to do? What's your role supposed to be? Mm -hmm in the process. So those four elements. Yeah, yeah, very important. Scott, um, looking at the time, um, mm. we have about 15 minutes left. Jesus, that, that's amazing how fast this has gone. It, it goes by fast. <laughs> we always have fun talking. But you've seen mental health systems uh, uh, around the world, you know, you work with, with therapists in the United States and North America, but also Scandinavia and other places around the world. So you've seen the mental health systems, you know, we're facing a mental health crisis that was exacerbated by COVID, but not it, the prevalence of mental disorders is, has always been rising in, in recent history. What can we do to provide better mental health services um, to those who need it? <laughs> that's a I know I know it's <laughs> that, that's a it's, it's such a it's such a huge question. And, and honestly I, I don't know that I have a, a good answer. I am a firm believer in what Sheldon Kopp said back in the 70s in his book called If You Meet the Buddha on the Road, Kill Him. And in there, he had a laundry list. He called it his laundry list of, uh, of observations about life. And he said, all solutions breed new problems. Mm -hmm. So you can always look on the other side of the planet and say, ah, if we only had the kind of mental health care system that they had, things would be a lot better. Americans look to the border in Canada and say, oh, if we only had the Canadian healthcare system, it would be better. And then the Canadians look and say much the same thing back. 
although each is grateful for what they have. So I don't know what the answer to that particular question, but I think that what would improve it regardless would be a learning organization, one that is wanting to learn from experience because things change, people change, clients change, and having some type of feedback and a dedication to learning in the moment from the experiences that we're having would help us make modifications in whatever system that we're working within Mm -hmm. and help and thereby help more people. There are some small things that we can do. For example, I think the telehealth change in COVID is one of the best Mm -hmm. things that's happened. And I'm grateful to see that we're gonna make that possible. Will it solve all problems? No. Will it create other problems? We're already seeing that, that other problems are being created. But you can't argue with the increased access. Mm -hmm. Number two, I think therapists have to, we have to, in a way, this is my, again, more radical side. I think we have to get rid of this idea of psychotherapy as sacrosanct, that it means 50 minutes with me doing X, Y, and Z to you. Uh, And instead, see this healing in a much more naturalistic kind of way. I think we have to empower natural healers in our communities. Mm -hmm. One of the unfortunate side effects of the professionalization of helping, which I'm all for, has been that indigenous healers, I mean, indigenous to particular cultures, have been displaced in some ways. It always discourages me when we say, oh, we're going to this or that country to teach them how to do mental health services. I think, oh, maybe we could learn from them how they do it, how they help others. Not that either is perfect, but that by joining forces and being willing to open our minds to different ways of helping might be a, might be a, a helpful process. And again, I think there are a million things we could do tinkering around the edges. One other one other piece, and it's probably radical and it's probably not what you meant, but this idea that we are treating disorders listed in a volume, the need for help is far greater than the disorders in that volume between those pages. And I think it does therapists a disservice to narrow their healing to I'm going to do CBT for depression of this variety or for PTSD of that variety. We've been chasing this rabbit for a long time and it it doesn't seem to me to have improved the mental health or well-being of the people that we work with. Well, it's interesting because you described uh, learning organizations um, in the same way you describe how individual therapists can get better. So if we have uh, systems of care, both at a, at a national level, but more importantly, I think at a local level, um, that really have the objective to um, assist people who are struggling in various ways. Yeah. We, we know that um, uh, there are social factors that exacerbate mental health conditions. Absolutely. We have racism, we have uh, uh, poverty, we have uh, stressors at work. And if we think about, well, let's just fix the problems after they occur, we really limit uh, uh, what we can do. Absolutely. I mean, we always thought as, as psychotherapists, we help one patient at a time. Hmm. We have to think beyond that. I, I agree completely. And th- th- tied to that for me is, and, and what I was saying earlier, if we view these problems as all between our ears, then we never get to the societal changes that might help. So some innovative programs that I know about have gone on in dis- different places of the world where healthcare systems support meeting at a coffee house for a coffee with people. The idea that, I mean, loneliness is at record levels in our culture, even though we're the most interconnected we've ever been, that's not going to be solved by a one-on-one meeting with me challenging 
your dysfunctional thinking. Mm -hmm. What's really going to help is if you're not in your house looking at your mobile phone, but you're having a chat with people. So those societal, small societal changes, uh, those little nudges, uh, I think might might prove very helpful in a broader view, which I think you've always really helped with, uh, for me at least as a mentor figure, that looking at a societal level rather than making the focus of our work the individual person. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting because loneliness uh, is a risk for mortality. Yeah. As great as smoking, uh, lack of exercise, excessive drinking, and so forth. Yeah. So, so the the um, kind of social changes that can occur um, would decrease loneliness and mental health as well as physical health. Yeah. Uh, Agreed. You know, when you say indigenous healing practices, it always occurs to mind, you know, in the United States, it's Native Americans, right? Mm. So, mm. But um, various groups have had uh, healing practices that are actually beneficial. So it isn't just um, minority or or uh, marginalized communities that have uh, different healing practices, but no. we really have to attend to how people make positive changes in their life in various ways. Yeah. And we know, I mean, John Norcross's work, who I interviewed recently, um, about self-help. Self-help mm. is particularly effective. Support mm. groups is another uh, more social way to do mm. So we we... I think what you're suggesting is we have to think of these alternatives, not in place of traditional psychotherapy, but in a more comprehensive uh, um, uh, social way. Absolutely. And I meant indigenous in that way, not just referring to the first Americans, uh, but not excluding uh, their, their insights either. The, I think it's important to remember in this respect that psychotherapy, in contrast to what we believe, did not start with Sigmund Freud. It started with people at the turn of the 19th century trying to figure out how to feel better. We had this problem of that was called railroad brain, I think, a neurasthenia that people were kind of discouraged and mildly depressed and not very happy. And so you had this whole movement in the United States that many of us haven't heard about, the the New Thought uh, movement, for example, things that emerged from kind of a religious context without all of the religious, Mm -hmm. associated religious practices and beliefs. All of those things are indigenous to the the dominant culture at that time. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, there, there's those um, uh, became popular in this industrial age where people were feeling more alienated and uh, needed um, more social aspects of, of healing. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Freud arrived in the United States to give his lectures at Clark University at a very... Uh, precise time that was we were we were just ready to hear something like this so <laughs> timing is always important it is it is important as well as political power and there ended up the confluence of events one was the rise uh, of professionalism in the field of medicine Mm-hmm. And medicines desired to make that kind of healing, which they had eschewed as non-biological and are therefore of, not of scientific value, until Freud gave it legitimacy. And then suddenly there was a way to sort of expand their vision. And I think maybe expanding our vision is what's called for now, given post-COVID we are seeing a rise in the number of people seeking help. That's a good thing. Now we need to have services as diverse of those as those peoples. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
uh, clearly we're, we're not meeting the needs of those seeking help. And then we also have to think of there are uh, uh, a number of people who are suffering mental distress or mental illness, however you want to say it, who aren't seeking treatment. Yeah. And that's an important uh, population as well. Yeah. Yeah, a- absolutely. And many of these have languished silently. I think of in our country, the number of people dying from opioids, for example, often mislabeled, in my opinion, as the fentanyl crisis. Yes, fentanyl is the agent, but mm-hmm. the societal circumstances that are giving rise to that, if we don't attend to that, then it'll be something else next. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Scott, this has been interesting conversation. Um, uh, uh, clearly, when you introduce some of your statements by this is a radical thought, uh, uh, I know it's an interesting conversation. Clearly, um, we have room for improvement. I mean, yeah. the... the data on individual psychotherapy as well as as studies of the prevalence of mental disorders and and uh in the population that we really do have to think um radically and you know if you if you look at what you said it's not that radical to think of learning organizations um uh, are necessary in order to meet the needs of people. So, you know, we always tell our students that everything I'm teaching you will be outdated in five to 10 years. So you have to learn how to learn. Yeah. But isn't it amazing how few of our organizations, including the universities where we espouse this, actually change? Yeah. 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 So yeah. the, the, Let's go back to the beginning of the interview, this idea that we really need this information about how we're doing as therapists Hmm. in order to both help an individual patient and to uh, improve. But the information is not sufficient. We really need to think like Anders Ericsson discussed. How can we deliberately practice to improve our skill Hmm. um, and continually get better outcomes. Hmm. That's a, that's a huge challenge to the field. And, and perhaps even more of a challenge I would say is knowing, believing that we are doing that when in fact we aren't. Mm -hmm. So the original one of the original findings we talked about was Renastat Norlinsky, which is therapists see themselves as developing over the course of their careers. Mm-hmm. That is a hard belief to crack. Well, Scott, um, uh, every time I mention the research that therapists don't improve over the course of their career, in fact, they slightly deteriorate. I can see the hostile looks of the audience uh, claiming, I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So it, it, it is, in, in order to get better at anything, we have to think that we're not at the top of our game and that there's room for improvement. I mean, yeah. that's just common sense, is it not? It, it is, but I think the automaticity that comes with repetition lends to this emboldens this sense of confidence Mm -hmm. and here again you be in a better position to comment on this than than i you need to be confident but not in the way we've traditionally been Mm -hmm. i know what i'm doing there's really not much room to improve or maybe if i go to this weekend workshop in emdr and apply that to my traumatizing i'll get better all of those things in fact, they haven't really improved us. So it's confident in a different way. And this is where I end up career-wise. I said at the beginning and several times during this that I'm an anxious therapist, but I'm confident that if I continue to push, 
Mm. I'll figure this out. And if I solicit critical input, I'll Mm. figure it out. It may not feel nice at the moment. In fact, sometimes it can be very disorienting, but that's the first step. Yeah. The new I mean, learning. This is similar to what uh, Helena Nissen Lee talks about in terms of professional self doubt. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I have to have a little bit of humility to examine what I'm doing. This hmm. idea, next time we talk, we'll talk a little more about automaticity because, you know, any skill we learn, we get to a point where it's fairly automatic. Yeah. And when we rely, excessively on the automaticity we miss a lot of what we need to do to get better i yeah. mean in a way automaticity is really important because we have to be efficient we have to learn good habits and so forth but it can be destructive in terms of um uh, creating the conditions that prevent us from getting a little bit better over time absolutely and i love that a little bit better. So we're not talking about a revolution here. We're talking about an evolution, Mm -hmm. a small improvements over time, sometimes with setbacks as you approach this new knowledge. Mm -hmm. And having that expectation also, despite my anxieties, helps me feel confident. I just got to just move just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, Scott, this has been Delightful. Uh, It's been educational and it's been thought provoking. So I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us and uh, um, wish you the best in in your efforts to improve mental health care. Thanks, Bruce. Can I say one more thing? Please. I, I appreciate the thanks. But at the beginning, I also mentioned how important relationships were. And you are a person that I've known for more than 40 years. And throughout that time, as you know, I've picked up the phone. You've responded. We've emailed. We've texted. We've written together. And this relationship is, has continued, oftentimes with you saying, mm, Scott, eh, this direction. Uh, well, that's how you know. Uh, and that's been invaluable to me uh, over the course of I don't know many people who are in contact with the person who was their first stats professor at <laughs> university. And I'm grateful for that. Well, Scott, we've always pushed ourselves to think about things differently mm-hmm. with this goal that we really are dedicated to improving care. Mm-hmm. And and that's what has been our bond through these years, I think. Yeah. So we got a few years left. Hopefully so. Thanks, Scott. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Making Therapy Better is brought to you by CarePaths. CarePaths offers a complete behavioral health EHR and practice management software solution including claims, billing, clinical notes and documents, scheduling, and teletherapy, all for one simple and affordable monthly price. CarePath's EHR is HIPAA compliant and ONC certified and can also support electronic prescribing for an additional fee. Their latest release, CarePath's Connect, includes automated measurement-based care and the ability to create a digital front door for your practice, as well as a free mobile app designed to increase patient engagement. If you're just starting your practice or are dissatisfied with your current EHR, go to carepaths.com to start your free trial today. To find out more about Bruce Wampold and his work as CarePath's Chief Clinical Officer, visit makingtherapybetter.com.